your rocking voice call out, call out a little bit scoffer. Was my sin and my sin that held you there? Up to the wall of the company. You won't pay my ransom. You won't pay it all night long. You won't pay my ransom. Thank you, Jesus. So freely flows the endless love you give to me. So freely, not dependent on my heart, as I am reaching out to be the love within your heart. As I am reaching out to be the love. So easy, I receive the love you give to me. So easy, not dependent on my heart, because I am reaching out to be the love.
so easy to receive your love. Not dependent on my heart or mind. All of you, my Lord. All of you, my Lord. Completely you, my Lord. Nothing of myself, Lord. All of you, my Lord. So easy, we receive you, Lord. So easy, we receive the love you give to us. Nothing of us, Lord. Not dependent on us, Lord. Reveal the love within your heart. Reveal your love for our joy. so great that he gave his only one and only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would never perish but have everlasting life we thank you Lord God that we love because you first loved us Lord God while we were still your enemies you gave your son Jesus to die on that cross because of his love we have this hope of eternal life Lord God so we receive your love today Lord God not dependent on our part Lord God given freely Lord God given completely Lord God so we thank you today Lord God and once again we remember your death your burial your resurrection that wonderful day when you rose to life again. We take the bread and we take the cup and we do this out of obedience to your command. We do this in remembrance of you, Lord God. And we do it proclaiming your death until you come again in glory. Lord God. Be revealed to us afresh today, Lord God, in the breaking of bread.
His word goes out as people receive it and believe it. New songs will come into hearts. There will be a new song heard in the highways and byways all over this land as men and women turn to him in faith. As men and women lay beside their idolatry and religion and turn to him and trust in him. There will be a new song, there will be a new hope, there will be a new sound, there will be new peace, there will be harmony in the home. Financial needs will be met. Health will come. But above all, his name will be lifted and honored and adored and worshipped. And addictions will fall off. Curses will be broken as new life goes forth. It is the sound of a new song, a new song springing forth from the hearts of newborn babies, newborn infants in Christ, as others come to faith in him as his word goes forth, bringing healing and restoration and deliverance, and protection and salvation. Thank you, Jesus. We are not ashamed of the gospel, Lord, because it is the power of God to save anyone who believes in our God. Your gospel, Lord, is the hope for this nation. Without your gospel, the nation has no hope, Lord God. But your gospel is the hope for the nation.
is that somebody should I might walk in the light. Walk, walk, walk in the night, walk in the night. Amen. It's so good to see you all again this morning, and uh, for those who join the line later on, um, we welcome you as well. Uh, and just to remind us again that we are recording the services, but they don't go out live, they go out next week. So if there's something that you want to see and just want to be included, then you just let us know, and we'll edit it. Um, we thank God for that ministry that God has opened up to, because we're still meeting people regularly who say, you know, when we tune into your services, uh, sister and former sister-in-law of mine from Florida, we met her at the weekend and uh, she gets up some mornings at six o'clock to watch our, our services. So we thank God for what he's doing. We don't know the extent of it, but we know that God is using this medium, you know, to bring the word to places and people that may never, uh, may never hear it otherwise. So uh, keep that ministry in prayer as well. Amen. Does anybody else have anything to share before we look at God's word today? on because uh, you know we've all <clears throat> we've all grown up or most of us have grown up outside of Christianity and we've all you know um, but most of us anyways have had parents who may not be in tune with God and in, in the way that, that he has brought us in tune with him and things you know have been spoken and uh, uh, you know words have words have power you know there's an old saying sticks and stones may break your bones but Names would never hurt you, but that's that's a lot of rubbish, you know. Names and things do actually have an effect, you know, many years down the road, and you know, I mean, many people who are still affected by things that have been said to them and spoken over them, you know, by parents in anger or ignorance or whatever, and and they've held on to those, not so much held on to the words, but they have held on to them. The words have held on, held on to them. So I think it's a, it's 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 a, something that we can definitely. Uh, uh, use or definitely hold on to Patricia because it is, you know, it is scriptural that we speak blessings and not curses. I also think it's wise that when we share something like that to do like you did and say, I don't know if we need to take this on because again, uh, like the Bereans, we hear what's said and we search the scriptures 
you know, but uh, in light of what you said, Patricia, yes, I do, I do believe that it is something that we, we need to do is just encourage our children and encourage, encourage our families as well. And because, you know, those who are outside of the kingdom, they don't hear many words of encouragement. And just encourage them and tell them, you know, how, how well they're doing and, and, you know, tell them that you're praying for them as well and, and uh, you know, encourage them, lift them up, bless them, because we have the power to bless with our tongues as well. Anyway, well, today we're looking at Matthew's Gospel, and the title of my message is Nothing Like the Love of God. There's nothing like the love of God. And Matthew's Gospel, and uh, chapter 22, we're going to read uh, a number of verses here. We are all very familiar, I'm sure, with what is to be said in this passage. So uh, before we start, somebody would just lift up our time in prayer, lift me up in prayer, so that we hear from uh, God, our hearts are open to hear from Him this morning. So somebody may just Lift us up in prayer this morning. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for the privilege of being here and able to hear your word. And we thank you, Lord, that when we come together, Lord God, that there is, there is a special anointing, Lord God, upon the fellowship, Lord God. We thank you that your presence is here with us. And as we have been worshipping you and experiencing your presence, we ask you now to, make, to open up ears physically but spiritually as well, Lord God. And we ask you, Lord God, to help us to receive that word and let it penetrate deep inside of us, Lord God, that it really speaks to our innermost being, Lord. And we thank you, Lord God, that we are being changed from the inside out by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you, now, Lord God, that the pastor is anointed, Lord God, to preach the word with boldness, Lord God. We thank you that it's effective as it goes forth, Lord God, because it's not from him, it's from you. And we thank you, your word is a two-edged sword, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord God, that it changes us, Lord God. It changes lives. So we give you praise and thank you for being here this morning, Lord God, and for, for our fellowship in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, just to remind you again of the words that song we sang earlier about the love of God that we have. Thank you, Patricia. We have freely received it. And those words, those beautiful words, not dependent on my part. So freely is the love he gives to us, not dependent on my part. Completely, completely, I receive the love he gives to me, not dependent on my part. And so easy, so easy, I receive the love he gives to me, not dependent on my part. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22 and verse 34, we read these words. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now we as, as, as followers of Christ sometimes may unwittingly believe that we actually do love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. And even that we might go so far as to say that we love our neighbour as ourselves, but we have to ask ourselves that question, do we really, do we really? Well, let's take a look and see. I read an article during the week uh, that outlined what it is to love God in this way. And to love God in this manner is first of all to love him with all your heart. So to love God with all the heart is to love nothing else in comparison to him and to love nothing that's not connected to him. To be ready to give up everything for him, to be ready to do everything for him, to be ready to suffer anything in order to please and glorify him. The person who loves God with all the heart is to have neither love or hatred for anything except what God has love or hatred for. No desire for anything except what he desires. Delight in nothing that he does to delight in and draw to nothing that he's not in favour of. This is what it is to love God with all the heart. I can't put up my hand and say that I love God that way. To love God with all your soul is to love God with all your life. Your soul is your life, your mind, your will and your emotion. And this kind of love is to be ready to give up even self for his sake. It's to put up with all sorts of torment to be prepared to be deprived of all kinds of comfort rather than to dishonor him. The person who loves God with all their soul takes life with all it has to offer 
and glorifies God through it all. To this person, life and death are nothing except this one thing. Life comes from God and death brings back to God. And this was the rock on which the martyrs of the church laid down their lives. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony and cared not whether they lived or died except that it was for Christ who gave them life. And this is what it is to love God with all your soul. Again, I can't take that box. To love God with all your mind or intellect is to have desire to know only God and his holy will. To do this is to believe, or to receive, sorry, with thanksgiving, with pleasure, and with submission, the sacred truths as set out in God's word. It's to study nothing except that which is necessary for the service of God, and to use it at all times to promote only his glory. Furthermore, to love God with all, his, all the mind is to leave aside every foolish and useless idea that would defile the soul. Again, I wouldn't get top marks there. In a word, the person who loves God with all the heart, with all the soul, and with all the mind, sees God in all things, thinks of him at all times, having his mind or her mind continually fixed upon God, acknowledging him in all his ways. The one who begins, continues, and ends all thoughts, words, and works to the glory of his name. This is the person who loves God with all the heart, soul, and mind. That person is crucified to the world and the world to him. He lives, yet not he, but Christ lives in him. He beholds as in a glass the glory of the Lord and is changed into the same image from glory to glory. Now knowing all this, can any of us today honestly say that we love the Lord, our God, with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind? We haven't even looked at loving our neighbor. I know I can't. So where does that leave us? There's good news. There is good news. And first of all, it's plain to see that it's impossible. It's impossible for anyone to love God in this way. So why did Jesus say this to the self-righteous Pharisees? Well, you see, the religious leaders had become so focused on keeping every minor detail of the law that they had completely lost sight of the real purpose of the law. They made a show, yes, of letting others know when they had broken the law, including Jesus, when he healed on the Sabbath, he couldn't be from God because he's broken the law. But at the same time, by their actions, they showed that they neither loved God nor their fellow men. And still, they thought they were keeping the law. Now, down through history, some of the cruelest acts known to man have been done to others in the name of the Lord by those who thought that they were defending his holy commandments. And the truth is, if a person violates one of those two greatest commandments in an effort to enforce another commandment, they're misapplying God's word and they're no different than those religious Jews. Jesus let, no, let the Pharisees know in no uncertain terms what the most important commandments were and he knew that they would see they couldn't keep them. The hope was that once they realized that the law had no power to save, they would turn to him as he is the only hope. We too are in that place. We knew deep down before we came to know God that what we were doing was just whitewash. We knew deep down that, you know, the wrongs we had done could never be made up for by the rights we were doing. But thanks be to God, one day that led us to the feet of Jesus when we heard the good news of what he had done for us. Now if God knows that we can never love him in the way he commands us to love him, what are we to do? Well, the good news is, and this is good news, we're no longer under the law but under grace. Under the old covenant, people were motivated to love God and their fellow men through fear of punishment if they failed to comply. In the New Testament, grace freely gives us the unconditional love of God as a gift. So freely, I receive the love you give to me. So freely, not dependent on my part, as I am reaching out, reveal the love that's in your heart. And it's his love in us that loves him back, not our own selfish love. It's his love in us that loves us back. And it's his love in us that gives us the power to love our neighbors as ourselves. In the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, the people were required to keep all of God's law. In the New Covenant, we see a different set of laws, not laws that we're required to keep, instead laws that are intended to keep us. The law of God's love is given to keep us. 
Under the old covenant, people were required to love God all day, every day. You shall love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. The new covenant declares that anyone who does not love, who does not love, does not know God because God is love. And in 1 John 4, 9 to 11, in this, and this is beautiful, in this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, so we also ought to love one another. Not that we have loved God. You see, God didn't wait for us to love him, to reveal his love to us, to reveal his son to us. While we were yet sinners, enemies of God, he sent Jesus, his son, to be the propitiation for our sins. We are who we are, not because we have loved God, as we have no ability in ourselves, but because he loved us. And his love was so great that it caused him to give, not just anything, not just something small. He gave his only begotten son as a propitiation. That means as a satisfactory substitution to be punished in our place. And if God so loves us, the scripture says, ought we not love one another? We love because he first loved us. This is the new covenant. In the old covenant, repentance of sin was the path to God's goodness. 2 Chronicles 7 14. If my people who are called by my name may humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Under the new covenant, it's something different. God's goodness and his kindness leads us to repentance. Do you not presume in Romans 2 4 on the riches of his goodness, of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. So in the Old Testament, you had to humble yourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from your wicked ways and then he heard you from heaven and he forgave your sin and healed your land. Under the new covenant, it's his kindness that leads us to repentance, that leads us to a change of mind that causes us to turn from unbelief to belief. And it's only when we have a revelation of God's kindness, of his patience and his goodness that we are led to that place where we can turn to him fully and completely. We had this revelation the moment we heard and believed the lens he went to in order to show his love for us. He went to great lens in order to show his love for us. In regard to sin, we're so blessed because compared to those who lived under the old covenant, their sins were never taken away they were simply covered in, in Hebrews 10, 10, 11. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Those sacrifices could never take away sins. But in the new covenant, we have a new high priest, a different sacrifice, and a different means of dealing with sin. In the next verse, but when Christ had offered for all time one single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down at the right hand of God. Never again do I have to get up and sacrifice. He sat down and there he sits until the day he returns. Today, as he sits on the throne of grace, he received our worship. He is seated in heavenly places. We are seated in heavenly places in the spiritual realm with him. He's seated there and one day he's getting up to come back again. But not until then he sits because his sacrifice was sufficient for all the sins of all mankind for all times. Mine, yours and everybody else's and people who are not yet born. Sins weren't just covered. John 1, 29, the next day he saw Jesus, John the Baptist, speaking of John the Baptist, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus took away the sin of the world. And in Romans 10, 4, Paul says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. 
Before Christ, the law was the path to righteousness and peace with God. When Christ came, he fulfilled the law completely so that we didn't have to. Because Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Is it to everyone who does right? No, to everyone who believes. Thanks be to God. Our forgiveness, our salvation, our eternal life, our blessings are not dependent on our part. Not dependent on us keeping God's law, but on Christ keeping them on our behalf. He kept the law on our behalf. Remember how earlier we said, or we read that Jesus said to the Pharisees that to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself are the two greatest commandments. And that all the law and the prophets hung on those two commandments or depended on those two commandments. That was the old. Now, look at the new. Galatians 5.14. The whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Do you see the difference? Old covenant, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. You should love the neighbor as yourself. For in this the law and the prophets hang. New covenant, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. What a difference. What a difference because we cannot, we could not, we would not love God in the way that he requires. So he loved us in the way he asked us to love him. And then he poured that love into our hearts. So now we have his love in our hearts. And when we love somebody else, we love that person with the love of God. Why did Paul leave out that bit then about loving the Lord? Because now it's the Lord who loves you. And it's his love that's at work, with, that's at work in you, not your love for him. The new covenant, the law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Just as in the Old Testament, the prophets were summed up in the commandment to love God and to love your neighbor in the new. There's a change of priesthood. And when there's a change of priesthood, there's a change of what? There's a change of the law. And the law is the law of love. Paul goes on in Romans 13 and verse 8, Oh, no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Here it is again. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So Paul echoes the same words here. Love each other, for in loving each other, the law is fulfilled. Not just each other in the body, but each other outside the, outside the body as well. And this is so powerful. Because all the commandments are summed up in this one. And it makes sense. If you love your neighbor, you won't have commit adultery with your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you won't show hatred, which is murder. If you love your neighbor, you won't steal from your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you won't covet his possessions. You won't lie. You won't do any of the things that are required by the law. In fact, if you love your neighbor, it says, you will do your neighbor no wrong. So how will I know that I'm fulfilling the law? How will I know, how will I know I'm loving my neighbor? It's all about love. It's all about love. It's all about love. And this is what love is. It's patient. And sometimes, more than not, we need patience with our neighbors and sometimes we need patience with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Love is kind. Love doesn't envy or boast. So we've nothing to boast about. Maybe we have something better than our neighbor. Maybe we've got a car. Maybe we have a nicer house. Maybe we have nicer clothes. But it's nothing to boast about. It's nothing to boast about. Because in Christ, we're all one. We can go this morning there was a man sleeping at the Back door, God loves him the same way that he loves us. Love is not arrogant. Love is not rude. I didn't tell him to get up and go away. I just spoke to him and he just responded and 
that have more to live. Love doesn't insist on its own way, and we have a tendency to want our own way at times. You know, we stand our feet like we did when we were kids, and we mightn't do it physically, but inside, we may be stamping our feet and saying, no, I'm not doing that, I'm doing it my way. It's not irritable or resentful. And yes, there are times when in our flesh, there's cause to be irritable, there's cause maybe to be resentful, but love is not, love is not. And this is where love must conquer. This is where we must allow the love of God to be so poured into us again and again and know how much that we receive it that we quench that irritability, that resentment. Love doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It, put up, it puts up on all things. It puts up on all things. Love never ends. Prophecies, they'll pass away. One day, we won't need to prophesy anymore because we'll be with the presence of the prophet. Tongues. Praise God for Patricia again bringing that message in tongues today. Tongues will pass away, they'll cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. And just a point on that, some have used that scripture to say that now that we have the written word of God, we don't need prophecy, we don't need tongues, we don't need interpretation because we have the fullness of God. And yet, when you look at the scriptures, there's so much written, especially in Corinthians, about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And if the gifts of the Holy Spirit weren't for that time after the written New Testament was available. Why was it written then? Because by the time it became available, if it had ended then, nobody needed to know how to go about it. And yet there's so much instruction on how to prophesy, how to, how to walk in the full gifts of the Spirit. So yes, the gifts are for today. And they're with us. And the only time they're not for is when Christ comes again to take us. That's just a side note. But love, this is love. And at the end of this passage, it's summed up in this. Faith, hope, and love abide. They live, these three. But the greatest of these is love. You see, the passage itself goes on to talk about, you know, no matter what you have, if you haven't love, you're nothing. You can have faith that can move a mountain, but if you haven't love, you're nothing. You can have hope for eternal life, and hope for today, and hope for tomorrow, but if you have love, you have nothing. But the good news today is this. God is not waiting for you and I to love him with all our heart, with all our soul, and all our mind. Because he's already poured his love into us. We already have that love in us. And it's that love in us that loves him back. But love, the law of love, is the fulfillment of all the commandments. That's what he said. It's summed up. The whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We all have been given the power to love the unlovable. And the only thing that stops us from doing that is if we decide not to love the unlovable. We will get plenty of opportunity to show love to our neighbor. We will get plenty of opportunity to be patient, to be kind, not to be envious or boastful, not to be arrogant, not to be rude, not to insist on our own way, not to be irritable or resentful, not to rejoice in wrongdoing, but to rejoice with the truth. We will get many opportunity to bear all things, to believe all things, to hope all things, to endure all things, because love never Faith, hope, and love, these three abide, but the greatest of these is love. And throughout the week, you will be reminded again and again because you will fall into it, you will trip yourself into it. I know because I do that. When I bring a message like this, I'm the one who trips up, and I know you'll trip up as well. But God will remind you, that little voice will remind you about my love. And we pull back, 
And the more we listen to that voice, the more we'll be able to show our love to our neighbor, to our friends, to our families. When they rub us up the wrong way, when they irritate us, when they are nasty to us, instead of answering them back with a sharp word, we'll just say nothing. Quietly, we'll just thank God for the law of love. I've had many tears and sorrows, I've had questions for tomorrow, there's been times I don't know right from wrong, but in every situation, God gave me blessed consolation, that my trials came to all men. I've been to lots of places and I've seen a lot of faces. There's been times I've felt so alone. But in those lonely hours, those precious lonely hours, Jesus let me know I was his own. Through it all. Through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus, I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend on His word. I thank God for the mountains and I thank Him for the valley. Thank you for the storms you brought me through. If I'd never had a problem, I wouldn't know my God with something. I'd never know what faith in God could do. But through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. Trust in God, true love, true I've learned to depend upon His I thank God. So I thank God for the mountains, and I thank Him for the valleys. Yes, I thank Him for the storms He's brought me through. For if I never I wouldn't know that he could solve me. I'd never know what faith in God could do. But through it all, through it all, I learned to trust in Jesus. I learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all. solve them, you can help us solve them, Lord God. We know what faith in you can do. And we do say today, Lord, that through it all, 
We've learned to trust you, Lord. And we've learned to trust in your word. Amen. So today we just thank you again for your blessed hope. Thank you for your word, which is steadfast and sure. And thank you for the hope that we have in you. Your love poured out, poured abroad in our hearts, Lord God. Thank you, my Jesus. As we go forth from this place today, Lord God, let us be ever ready, Lord God, to listen to your voice, just reminding us again of your love and reminding us to pour your love out of us into others, Lord God. For as we love our neighbours as ourselves, this is the fulfilment of all of your law. So we bless you and we thank you this day for this gathering unto you. We thank you for those who would watch online. We pray, Lord, your blessing would go forth, Lord God. Your word would bring hope and peace. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.